Even though America was heavily engaged in World War II in the fall of 1942, I felt safe in enrolling in college because the Marines and the Navy had turned me down. I wore glasses. They were still being very selective, and anyone who wore glasses was an automatic reject. However, the Army was not the least bit disturbed by my slight visual impairment, and on September 19, 1942, drafted me as a raw recruit, just a week before classes opened at Michigan State, where I had been awarded a football scholarship. A group of us were inducted at Fort Custer, Michigan, where we were issued uniforms and long-needled shots, sat through films on venereal disease, and took a lengthy IQ test. Two days later, we boarded a train with blinds drawn and were on our way to parts unknown. Rumors as to our destination quickly began, but no one guessed correctly. After two days, the train finally stopped, and some of us sneaked a peek through the blinds to discover we were in Macon, Georgia. And that Camp Wheeler was to be my home for the next five months. The camp was a few miles outside Macon, and by a long coincidence, happened to be only about 135 miles from my birthplace in the hills of northern Georgia. We were immediately screened for assignment by sergeants who seemed to know all about us. I requested the Army Air Force, but was denied. The sergeant informed me my basic training would be with a special battalion of men who were considered to have officer potential. At this point, the Army really had very little knowledge of our abilities, except for whatever the IQ test was worth. For the next seven weeks, we struggled through a basic infantry course, with the usual KP and guard duties with lectures on fundamentals such as military courtesy, some weapons training and actual firing on the rifle range, bayonet drill, and hand-to-hand -hand combat. Everything was very strange and new to me. I had never been away from home for more than a week and was totally ignorant of the Army. At first, I didn't know a corporal from a sergeant, and officers seemed like gods to me because everybody, including the sergeants, jumped to rigid attention when they appeared. For reasons quite unknown to me, I was picked immediately as an acting squad leader over 12 men. Possibly this was because of my athletic background, or maybe because, to them, I appeared eager to learn how to be a soldier. The second half of BASIC was in communications. We were trained in the use of field phones, laying wire, using codes and code devices, and message center operation. The training was interesting, and our lieutenant was an excellent instructor. Near the end of BASIC, we were told we could apply for Officer Candidate School, OCS, and 78 of the men in my company signed up. Then we found it was not quite as simple to get accepted as it at first appeared. We were required to go before a board of six officers chaired by a colonel. They really gave us the third degree. We were asked all sorts of questions, some very personal. Our military bearing and quickness of response seemed as important as the correctness of our answers. It seemed as though they deliberately tried to get us confused, and apparently in many cases they succeeded in doing so, for they eliminated 61 and passed only 17 for admittance to OCS. At the end of basic training, the 17 of us from my company, along with some others from the rest of the battalion, were moved about a mile across camp to non-commissioned officers' school. This was the final step before OCS. It was a very tough, intensive four-week course and only five of us passed and were promoted to corpora and made eligible for OCS. At last, we were sent across the state to the infantry school at Fort Benning. For the next three months, the training was most concentrated and intense. We worked day and night in both classroom and field. It was a damn good, rough, tough cram course on weapons, tactics, map reading, close order drill, field maneuvers, and basic infantry training. Some of the men couldn't take the rugged physical program or the mental strain of the classes, and so they flunked out and were quietly transferred. Only two of my original group survived to get commissions. Somehow I made it, and on May 8, 1943, I was duly commissioned a second lieutenant in the Army of the United States. By act of Congress, we were now officers and gentlemen. Some called us 90-day wonders. My first assignment as an officer was to Camp Croft, South Carolina, as a basic training instructor. Then, only a month later, a group of us were picked out and dispatched to Camp Hood, Texas, to help start up a newly conceived seven-week crash course for the basic infantry training of college students. After this basic, they would be returned to college, and thus Uncle Sam 
would not call on the country's future brains as cannon fodder, short of dire emergency. This experimental program never really got off the ground. Only 800 men or so were trained in six whole months by enough instructors to cater an entire division of many thousands. Most of the time, we instructors were bored silly and exhausted by the effort of trying to find something to occupy our time. Having no students, the instructors practiced instructing each other. After a while, even the brass gave up on the futile effort. So we played horseshoes, volleyball, and found similar pastimes for six months. My own training regiment did not receive a single college man to train. Finally, three days before Christmas in 1943, 30 of the officers from my regiment were sent to the 86th Division, then on maneuvers in the swamps of Louisiana. We struggled through the mud and rain and ice of the swamps until February 1944 and learned very little other than how to exist in such terrible conditions. <laughs> the weather was worse than any I had ever been through in Michigan. Next, we moved into nearby Camp Livingston, Louisiana, and resumed regular garrison training. The Army brass decided, however, that the 86th the Division was not fit for combat as a unit and began to break it up. Almost every day we received orders to ship out a few more men and officers as overseas replacements. It became quite a tooth job choosing the men for the list, and each unit commander naturally tried to hang on to his best men. Finally, in April 1944, my own turn came, and I was ordered to Camp Shanks, New York, with seven days leave at home en route. At Camp Shanks, we received all of our overseas shots, and a few days later we were on our way to England in a huge convoy of about 100 ships, an awesome sight for this young man. After 12 days in the North Atlantic, bucking through a tremendous storm that left most of us seasick and a little jumpy from two submarine alerts during which our destroyer escorts dropped quite a few depth charges, we arrived safely at Liverpool, England, about April 20, 1944. The first stop was Camp Warminster, a British Army base camp near Bristol. The base was overflowing with American infantry replacements, officers and men bound for combat divisions to replace battle casualties. We at once began some very limited training, mostly to keep us busy. Weapons were carefully cleaned and inspected daily. We also played a lot of ping pong, and I had the fun of pitching a little base ball. When D-Day, June 6, 1944, finally arrived, we watched its progress on a big operations map in the officers' quarters. From this very distant, very safe position, it was hard to imagine the real fighting. Then, late that evening, we began to get a few of the wounded paratroopers and some who had landed in the channel. They were from the 82nd Airborne, and we crowded around to hear their excited, on-the-scene stories of the fighting. Many of them were on the way back to their units the very next day. Soon replacements were needed, and we were on our way to an assembly area near Plymouth. Security was very tight, and we could only learn that we would be leaving shortly for France. The next day, as I looked into the anxious faces of the officers around me on board the Canadian Landing Craft Infantry, LCI, leaving the crowded harbor at Plymouth, it struck me suddenly. This is it. We were headed directly into the war. Now, near the end of June 1944, our alliés had slowly gained a foothold in Normandy, France. Underway, each of the officers aboard seemed to be quietly facing his own personal battle with reality. It still seems a foolish mistake to have had the entire load on our LCI be all officers. The loss of a boatload of junior-grade combat officers would make very big problems for the people tasked with the manning of combat units. Now the words of the port commander leapt back vividly. You are going to Normandy as replacements. This could only mean that the position each of us was being sent to fill had become vacant because the other officer was killed in action. KIA, wounded in action, WIA, missing in action, MIA, or a non-battle casualty, NBC. All sorts of dismal thoughts chased one another across my mind. I wondered about my fiancée, Florine. How long before she would know I was at the front? Would I ever see her again and hold her in my arms? If I got wounded badly, would she still love me? Would I be able to support her? Somehow it seemed clear to me that I would make it. I was brought back to the present by the drone of the duty officer calling the roll.
As I listened and watched each respond, it was obvious we were a mixed lot. I did not recognize anyone. It probably didn't matter because we would all be sent to different units once ashore. As hunger began to gnaw at my empty stomach, it occurred to me that none of us had rations. Somehow, we had been sent aboard without chow. Someone took our problem to the Canadian naval captain, who came to our rescue with some cans of split pea soup from his emergency rations, one can each. Each can held about two cups and was heated by a cylinder in the center, filled with some chemical that burned. Instructions told us to punch two holes in the top of the can before igniting the fuel. Otherwise, the can could explode. The soup was delicious, and I've loved pea soup ever since. Someone was shouting, Look at all the ships! And we jumped up to see a glorious sight. Ships by the hundreds were everywhere ahead as we approached Normandy. We strained to see the armada. Huge balloons were straining at cables. They were supposed to keep enemy aircraft from flying too low. The harbor was busy as a beehive. Cargo nets were being loaded in waiting amphibious trucks called ducks. A steady stream came out for a load and then headed back to shore. Vehicles like ants seemed to crawl all over the beaches and inland roads. We lurched forward as our LCI came to a grinding halt on the flat bottom. Gangplanks were lowered on each side of the bow, and we started single file down into the water. Holding our weapons high, we headed for shore. The water was up to my chin, and some of the shorter men had to be helped. The fighting for Utah Beach had been light compared with Omaha Beach. Of course, those who were wounded and died there would never agree that it had been an easy battle. I understand most of the credit for the success goes to General Roosevelt, son of President Teddy Roosevelt. We sure were grateful the beach had been secured. I'm sure much of the horrible results of that battle had been cleared away, and all the dead and wounded were gone. Still, the terrible scars of war seemed to shout at us. Burned out vehicles, sunken landing craft, ships, tanks. Guns, pillboxes lay twisted and still. It hardly seemed possible anyone could have survived, yet men had waded in and driven the Germans back, now some seven or eight miles inland in most places. We marched quickly inland to a replacement center near St. Mary Lees. Our first instructions were to pair off and set up pup tents in an apple orchard nearby. We would stay there until assigned to our units. It was impossible to find out where we would be going or when. Most of us took a good look at the situation map, and it appeared the front was about three miles from us. We could clearly hear our artillery all night as a constant shelling seemed to be taking place. The concussion was close enough to shake our tents, and sleep was difficult. St. Maryglise was the small town made forever famous in the movie of D-Day. There, the 82nd Airborne stubbornly fought its way back toward the coast to link up with the 4th Infantry Division. Had I known the 4th was to be my unit, perhaps I would have asked more about the battle there. Since we were not confined to camp, several of us took the opportunity to see some of the battle area nearby. Our noses and grapevine information led us to a burial site about a quarter of a mile away. The ghastly stories we had heard about the fierceness of the fighting were true. German war prisoners were digging up the partially decomposed bodies of their own dead, buried in neat rows in mass graves about three feet deep, for movement to a new location. Working with shovels and bare hands, the prisoners stuffed the corpses into mattress covers and piled them on trucks in rows, like cordwood. Some of the bodies were badly mangled and very difficult to pick up. Stern-faced men turned white, and many had to turn away to vomit at the sight and smell. The guard stated that several hundred American bodies had already been moved a few days before. Over 300 Germans had been buried in the mass grave, but the two fields were being cleared to make way for a fighter plane airstrip. Near the graves were the wrecks of many gliders, some still hung up in trees, others smashed into hedgerows, all riddled with bullet holes. It's a wonder to me that any of the glider troops survived or were able to fight once on the ground. I had tried to join the paratroops shortly after OCS. I was rejected because I wore glasses. We walked through a field that had been shelled by the Navy, probably with rockets. The holes were about four feet deep and six feet across. They covered a pattern about 20 feet apart, over a couple of acres. It seemed impossible that anyone could have survived such a bombardment. We were pretty quiet as we made our way back to the tents. For me, 
the cruel realities of war came into vivid focus, and for the first of many times I felt the intestinal stirrings of fear. Finally, on July 12th, orders came through. I was assigned to the 22nd Infantry Regiment of the 4th Infantry Division. About a dozen of us climbed onto a two-and-a-half-ton truck and were driven through Carrington on our way to service company of the 22nd Infantry. Our first taste of shelling occurred as we crossed a small bridge near Carrington, but it screamed overhead and exploded about 100 yards beyond us. Captain Hawkins, the commanding officer, Shio of Service Company, met us warmly. He took us directly to headquarters of the 22nd Infantry nearby, somewhere in the swamps near Carrington. Colonel Buck Lanham was there to greet us. He was a small, wiry man who looked as tough as he was gruff. He wasted no time in scaring the hell out of us. He stated flatly that the German resistance was very stubborn, and our losses were extremely high. He explained how tough it was to cross a field with the Germans dug in behind every hedgerow, Machine gun crossfire made advance very difficult. We are only able to gain a few hundred yards each day. As officers, I expect you to lead your men. Men will follow a leader, and I expect my platoon leaders to be right up front. Losses could be very high. Use every skill you possess. If you survive your first battle, I'll promote you. Good luck. After our brief indoctrination by Colonel Lanham, we were assigned at random to various battalions within the regiment. Five of us were ordered to follow our guide to 2nd Battalion headquarters, then in regimental reserve roughly a quarter mile behind the front lines. Our guide was a corporal who was tired, hollow-eyed, and jittery. He acted like a cornered animal. Just watching his actions gave one the creeps as, bent low, he ducked and ran from one piece of cover to the next. We ran with him down farm lanes, between hedgerows, some were sunken below ground level. We passed many empty foxholes dug along the banks. Some were partially covered with wood or metal torn from some farm building. Bodies of dead Germans were strewn along the way. They lay as they had fallen, in grotesque positions, glossy-eyed, cheeks sunken, mouths open. The awful odor of death was increased by the hot July sun. The guide said, Our dead had already been moved, and we were grateful. 2nd Battalion Headquarters was in a rather large field with most of the battalion dug in nearby. Headquarters was just a small 10 by 12 tent set up under a tree near a hedgerow. Lieutenant Colonel Lum Edwards was in command. He greeted us briefly, but made no speech. Captain Tom Harrison, the S3, assigned us to companies. Lieutenant Pizarak and I were assigned to E Company. We became very good friends and served together from July until November, when he was killed in action. We had to go across the field to report to Captain Holcomb, commander of E Company. Lieutenant Pizarek was assigned to the 1st Platoon, and I was sent to the 2nd Platoon. Lieutenant Plume and Lieutenant Tawas had the 3rd and 4th Platoons. One thing I felt important was learning the names of my men, so I made a real effort, and the men were pretty surprised to have me call all 40 of them by name the very first day. My first concern was my non-coms. Sergeant Chick Reed was the platoon sergeant. The assistant platoon sergeant was Otha Anders. These men had landed on D-Day and had about one month's combat experience. I was grateful they were both willing and able to give me a lot of useful pointers on what it was like at the front. At least four other officers had already been casualties in my platoon, and only five men of the original 40 who landed on D-Day were still assigned. I was lucky to have a few days with my new platoon before going into battle. Later, I saw many green lieutenants sent up to take over platoons in the thick of battle. They had no chance to meet any of their men, or to find out who the non-coms were. I can't imagine a tougher, more demanding job being thrust upon any young man than that of a frontline infantry platoon leader. My platoon was dug in behind a hedgerow directly across the field, about 200 yards in front of our battery of 105 mm self-propelled artillery. At first, this didn't concern me but it proved to be quite disturbing as they began firing during the night. Not only was it very noisy, but the concussion caused the sides of my foxhole to cave in several times. Of course, sleep was almost impossible, even without the artillery. For my mind was filled with fears and questions about what it would be like to lead men in combat. How would I face my responsibilities? Perhaps tomorrow would tell. <laughs> 
One evening just before dark, while standing in line for hot chow, we got a real thrill. Four German fighter bombers zoomed right over us at treetop level. We scattered instantly and dove for the nearest cover, but their target seemed to be somewhere near the coast. In seconds, just about every anti-aircraft gun and machine gun within range opened fire, and we could easily follow the path of the planes by the red glow of the tracers. Every fifth machine gun bullet was glowing white phosphorus to help the gunners see where they were shooting. The display looked just like the fireworks back home on the 4th of July, but the planes were so fast and so low that they were gone before anyone could take good aim, and none of them appeared to be hit. About July 16th, our regiment moved northeast close to St. Lo. Here we got the news that we were to become part of a special task force of tanks and infantry, with no other purpose than making a major breakthrough of the German lines. This was the first large-scale tank infantry team action ever undertaken by the Allies. The enemy in our immediate front was to be carpet-bombed before our jump-off, and then a large army of tanks and infantry would drive through any hole created. The crucial problem was the hedgerows. In Normandy, for generations, the farmers had grown hedges to separate their fields, however small. They had started by digging small ditches around the edges of the fields. The earth was piled in rows between two fields, and over the years many of these dirt piles grew to become over two feet thick and three feet high. Hedges were planted on top, and their roots prevented erosion. Various bushes and trees also took root to form a barrier strong enough to fence in livestock. The Germans, of course, seized upon hedgerows as the natural earthworks they were. They were excellent for the defense. Easy to hide behind, the thick dirt embankment served as a very good shield against our small arms. Usually the Germans put machine guns near the corners of each field, giving them a crossfire that made a frontal attack by infantry nearly suicidal. Sometimes the poor infantry would fight a whole day to gain a few hundred yards, and that only if they were lucky. The special tactics that were developed called for the tanks to break out into a field and spray the next hedgerow with their machine guns, while the infantry walked or ran behind the tanks, using them as shields. When the tanks got close enough to the hedgerow, they'd raise their fire a little, and the infantry would run ahead, keeping as low as possible, throwing grenades over the hedge. The tanks would plow through the hedges, and the infantry would follow closely, then fan out to either side to capture any remaining enemy. Originally, a tank could not handle a hedgerow very well, because the dirt mounds would tilt them up and expose their relatively vulnerable underbellies to the German Panzerfaust, a lethal, armor-piercing rocket grenade similar to our bazooka, capable of knocking out a tank. After a while, a sharp steel, scythe-like bumper fashioned from old train rails and the scrap iron from German beach obstacles, was welded to the front of tanks about a foot above the ground. It sliced a chunk out of the hedge, which allowed the tank to keep low as it burst through and took the Germans by surprise. If all went as planned, we would mop up the enemy and continue the attack across to the next hedgerow, and the one after. The tactic seemed practical enough, but even in dry runs it was utterly exhausting to carry all our gear while running behind tanks, bathed in their hot fumes and the churned-up dust. After several days of grueling drill in the new tactics, we were ready to go. Every day we got our gear together and waited for orders to jump off. That went on for about a week, because the bombers that were to do the carpet bombing were grounded by the rotten weather. All the waiting didn't do our nerves any good. Meanwhile, there were a few sidelights. One day I came upon one of my young soldiers who had his pistol in hand, apparently getting up the nerve to use it on himself. He was terribly depressed because he hadn't received any mail from home since his landing in France. I sat down and quietly talked with him alone for quite a spell until he was assured his family really did care, but that our mail was all messed up because of the fighting. The very next day he received a couple of letters and that snapped him out of his depression. One day, our ever-resourceful cooks decided to treat us. They said that a nice young cow had wandered into enemy mortar fire, and that fortunately, they had been nearby and so knew it was fresh meat. The steaks were a marvelous change from regular army rations. A little later, however, 
Captain Holcomb was come wad embarrassed when a French farmer came calling and excitedly demanded payment for his slaughtered cow. He was turned over to a major for military government, and I suppose something was worked out. Another day, Major General Barton, our division commander, held a regimental review to award medals for heroic actions since the invasion. As we marched by companies to the parade field, some German fighter planes roared over at treetop level, and men and heroes scattered in every direction, with some diving right through dense hedgerows. The planes never fired on us, and may never have seen us, so we resumed our march to the review. We kept looking over our shoulders, but the planes never circled back. One of the men had some barber tools, so we took turns sitting on a stump for a quick haircut. I don't remember getting my haircut again during the next eight months.